Welcome to our latest episode, Navigating the Perils of Flea Clauses. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about what flea clauses are, as well as their benefits and dangers. This is a topic that anyone with an asset protection trust or anyone thinking about setting one up should be aware of. Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored Podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton. Let's dive into today's show. So a flea clause is an automatic migration provision contained in a trust. Basically, it says that upon the happening of an event of jeopardy or duress, the trust will automatically migrate or flee to another safer jurisdiction. An event of jeopardy can include things like war, an invasion, a military occupation, revolution, a state of emergency, the government starting to nationalize assets, the implementation of currency controls, hyperinflation, or an intentional devaluation of the currency, or something like the abolition of laws favorable to the trust. The list goes on and on, right? You have wide latitude to define what qualifies as an event of jeopardy in your trust agreement. Now, an event of duress is a little bit different. So an event of duress is, for example, a lawsuit or a claim against the trust or a court order ordering the trustee to distribute assets in contravention to the trust agreement, or like a government request or demand for information about the trust, or the mandatory replacement of the current trustee in contravention of the trust agreement. Again, there's wide latitude in drafting and defining what an event of duress is. Now, flea clauses sound good, like they offer a lot of protection, because if your trust is in a country where shit hits the fan, or becomes unfavorable, or the trust gets attacked, the trust automatically moves to greener pastures to another trustee in a different, safer jurisdiction. Sounds like a flea clause is something you'd want to have in your trust. Well, maybe. When you read a flea clause, it sounds like all upside. Why wouldn't you want to include it in your trust? And that's exactly why so many advisors include flea clauses in their trust, because their clients are dazzled by the brilliance of this clause and their advisor. Plus, they figure the likelihood of the flea clause ever actually being used is fairly small, so why give it any deep thought? The problem is that most advisors know only enough to be dangerous. They don't fully think through the complications and unintended consequences of flea clauses. They just want to sell trusts as quickly and for as much money as they can. But let's take a closer look. Let's say, for example, that your flea clause includes in the definition of an event of jeopardy, a state of emergency. Sounds reasonable that you'd want your trust moved out of a jurisdiction where there's a state of emergency. Do you know how many countries declared a state of emergency during the pandemic? A lot. If your trust was in such a jurisdiction, it would need to automatically migrate. Or how is the abolition of laws favorable to the trust defined? It seems pretty vague to me. What if the law has changed, making it a little bit less favorable, but it's still pretty favorable and you can live with it? Does the trust have to automatically migrate? Or what if the law was changed, but it's still more favorable than any alternative jurisdictions? What do you do in that case? As you can see, you must carefully think through what an event of jeopardy is. And the same goes for thinking through what events of duress are. So what happens if your trust and its assets are in the same jurisdiction? In the event of duress, the trust may automatically migrate, but that doesn't mean the assets do. Although the court in that jurisdiction may no longer have jurisdiction over the trust, they may still have jurisdiction over the assets, in which case the migration probably wasn't that helpful. Again, you have to think all this through and game out scenarios until you find one that you're happy with. Don't accept template flea clauses that most advisors offer. They're dangerous and they generally are not well thought through and therefore don't work the way you really wanted them to work. And there's other considerations as well. So for example, you need to ensure that the laws of the jurisdiction that you plan to move to are compatible with the laws of the jurisdiction that you're leaving. You need to know if there's any tax consequences to migrating and understand what they are. 
You need to understand the regulatory environment and requirement in the jurisdiction that you're migrating to. And you need to know the mechanics, cost, and complexities of actually migrating. You can't wait until an event of jeopardy or duress happens to figure this out. You need to plan in advance. You need to know where you're going before an event of jeopardy or duress ever happens. You also need to understand the mechanics of the migration process and the consequences. And remember, things change. So the jurisdiction that you chose to migrate to in the event of an event of jeopardy or duress, when you first set your trust up, may not work when the migration actually needs to take place, which means you have to constantly monitor whether your backup jurisdiction is still the right one, and if not, you need to change it. But the biggest issue people miss is not a legal or a tax issue, it's a practical one. When you migrate to another jurisdiction, you need a new trustee in that jurisdiction. I don't know if you've ever been through the process of getting on boarded with a professional trustee, but it's lengthy, often quite frustrating. They need to do all their due diligence on the people involved with the trust to make sure they're not criminals. They need to verify that the source of wealth is clean and they need to understand the assets that are in the trust. This takes time. It can take months. Months you won't have in the event of an event of jeopardy or duress. So for a flea clause to be effective, you already have to be onboarded with a trustee in your backup jurisdiction. And they need to be kept updated on what's going on with your trust so that they're gonna be comfortable taking it over at a moment's notice. They're not gonna to wanna to be on boarded two years ago, and then you need to migrate today, and they have no idea what's happened in the trust in the last two years. They're gonna to wanna to feel comfortable with everything that's happened or is happening in the trust before they take over. So if you're gonna have a flea clause in your trust, you need to pick your backup jurisdiction in advance and understand what it takes to actually migrate and what the consequences of that migration are. And you need to have a trustee on board that can take over on a moment's notice. So just to recap, we've covered what flea clauses are, how they work, their benefits, their dangers, and most importantly, how to make them work effectively. To learn more about trusts and foundations, check out my trusts and foundations guide. I put a download link in the description. I hope you found this episode useful. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.